Okay, great. So thank you for that introduction. I'm honored to be here today. Um, I'm Susie Bentley, and I'm representing the Simulation Center at Elmhurst and Emergency Medicine at Sinai and Elmhurst. Here to talk today about in situ code team SIM and latent safety threat analysis and its novel uses for educational needs assessment. I have no disclosures. I have no conflicts. Agenda, pretty standard, what we'll go through today. So objectives for this talk are to define in situ simulation and its utility in identifying latent safety threats to patient safety. We'll talk about what those latent safety threats are. Describe the use of in situ sim as a novel educational needs assessment tool. And I'll frame the above through our code team simulation initiative. So some background before we get right to the project. So I want to talk about what in situ simulation is, what latent safety threats are, and some overarching objectives for simulation in general. So does anyone know what in situ simulation is, what it means? Absolutely, thank you. So that's exactly what it is. It's a team-based training technique in the actual patient care setting, done with the real resources, the real teams, they're on duty, they don't know often that it's even a simulator until they're in the room, because um, everything is embedded as if it was a real patient. So why do we need in situ simulation and systems testing? <laughs> Because healthcare is incredibly complicated. So when you take a system and you break it down, especially in healthcare because of the complexities, the whole is so much more than the sum of its parts. And it's not linear relationships that we're looking at here. If something teeny tiny in the car, one small part breaks down, it could have catastrophic effects and be very hard to find. You could know the best engine to pick out, the carburetor, and how to put them together it doesn't necessarily mean that you understand how the rest of the car functions. And this is just one analogy. So in situ sim can be used to get to work is done. So work is done is what we actually care about. It's patient outcomes. It's what we're actually doing at the bedside for those patients. So there's lots of ways to get it. Work is imagined. Work is abstracted. This is policies, procedures, focus groups, people sitting around tables saying what they think is best. In situ sim lets us look at everything in real life to get as close to examining and being able to safely manipulate and then examine the work that we're doing to get to work is done and to improve it if it needs to be improved. It takes us from ACLS, which is Advanced Cardiac Life Support, which is algorithms of what medicine we're giving when we're doing certain medical interventions. It's a great course. Many of you in the room have taken it, or PALS, the pediatric equivalent for cardiac arrest life support, does not do leadership training, does not tell you how to communicate. It tells you what to do and what meds to give. And we're trying to take that, which is super important, and translate it into how do we communicate? How do we lead? How do we work together on teams? Something that is not very well done, like I said, in that course. Trying to get away from procedure education in isolation, which is some of the top pictures. There's a chest tube, an airway head. Super important. Bread and butter, what we do in the Sim Center every day. You can see the Sim Center on the bottom, trying to get people out of this beautiful, pristine Sim Center. You could probably eat off the side of the Mayo stand at the, you know, the bedside. Into, right, is this what your, ED, yeah, what the ED looks like? Trying to go into the pressure cooker of where we actually see patients, right? And these are some pictures of real in situs being done. You can see there's lots of people, there's lots of hands on the mannequin, there's lots of equipment on the floor, it's messy and it's chaotic. And this is where we need to be training our providers if we really want to be able to put them as close to real life as possible. So let's talk a little bit about why we do systems testing. So we want to do error management, right? We're trying to catch the errors and the near misses before they become sentinel events. We've gone away from a culture of root cause analyses and other systems of error management that say, this happened and it was terrible. This can never happen again. Whose fault is it? RCAs 10, 20 years ago, it used to, you know, you were trying to write down the individual's name that made the mistake that led to the patient death, 
right? And it maybe wasn't quite that simple. The culture, thankfully, and the science has changed so much to acknowledging that error is not just an individual isolated event made by one individual. It's always about the fault in the system, in the process, and the conditions that set people up to make those mistakes. So I'm sure you, many of you heard, have heard of the Swiss cheese model. It's how did we fail all of our redundancies and all of our backup plans? How did all of those things fail such that one error then led to a bad outcome? And we're trying to look again at those systems. So the 1999 IOM report, probably one of the most famous quotes in medicine, to err is human. And I love this because it is so, so true. I think our human capital, our, our people, our doctors, our nurses, our teams, are really the most valuable part of medicine and also the most complicated, and people make mistakes. So how does the system protect those people from making mistakes? What can we do to improve the system? So active errors, by definition, they're attributed to immediate actions of a single human to cause an error, and they're mistakes. And if we address those mistakes, which we often do and we need to, it'll be a temporary fix. It's once we look at the latent conditions or the safety threats in the system that have allowed the active errors to happen and to have an impact, the quote, accidents waiting to happen, when we can look at the bigger context, that's when we can actually come up with sustainable solutions. And that's what Insight2Sim can do for us. So getting a little bit more into the latent safety threats, and then we'll talk about what we've found through our code team project. Latent safety threats, and you can see the definition up there, but they're hidden system-based threats. They're hazards in the clinical system due to errors in design, organization, training and education, or maintenance that may contribute to errors and may go on to have significant impact on patient safety. These are the things we want and need to identify in order to make the system safer so that we don't have near misses and we don't have bad outcomes. There are many ways to classify latent safety threats. For our project and commonly done right now in many research arenas with, uh, with patient safety education and research is the WHO or the World Health Organization's framework and it groups these threats as you can see into four categories. So equipment threats, medication threats, resource system threats, and technical skill. And I'll give you one example of each. An equipment threat is something as simple as something not being stocked when you need it. So the cordis, the giant large bore central line IV to give blood product during a massive GI bleed or a trauma is empty in a case. And the patient comes in and now it's a real patient and the drawer is empty. You've activated massive transfusion, you have the blood, they're bleeding out in front of you, you don't have the equipment to give them the blood. It's a major patient safety threat. If you can pick that up in a simulation and fix it and then come up with a system that that drawer is never not stocked again, then you have saved future patients from harm. These are, many of these are very simple things. It's just without a system in place to capture them and fix them, they continue to go unidentified. So medication threats. <clears throat> This was back when I was a resident, but we realized there were two different concentrations of an anesthetic medication in the Pyxis. So if people were ordering, I want three milliliters of ketamine, they could be getting a milligram or 20 milligrams based on the differences in concentration. So what are the things in the system to prevent this from happening? So they stop stocking different concentration of, of medications. Resource system threats, um, these are not hard to imagine, but distracting loud physical environment. So if anyone's ever been to a code, I would imagine you have probably seen that it is often loud and it is often chaotic. People not knowing roles. And then technical skill focuses very much on educational solutions because these are really knowledge gaps. So not knowing the correct size when you want to put in an intraosseous line. So a bone drill to give medication in an emergency. It's great to know how to do the procedure, but if you don't know then based on the size of the patient what size needle you're giving, you can't do the procedure. You can't then save that person. You need someone else to pick up the slack. And then doing a procedure correctly, but leaving sharps on the bed. Again, these are not you know, rocket science things, but they're things that are happening and they're themes that we pick up time and time again. 
So the major benefits of using in situ SIM are improved reliability and safety in high-risk environments, and that's due to the realism you get when you're stressing teams and you're stressing systems with the exact same distractions, the exact same resource limitations and obstacles that they would encounter on a daily basis. You can identify these latent threats, these systems issues, and provider knowledge gaps in real time and then capture them in order to fix them. And we can use it as a novel educational needs assessment. So how do we decide what we're going to teach? We have gestalt, we have experts, we feel like anecdotally we know what's missing. We do formal needs assessments, many of which we go to the providers, we ask them, how many ICU rotations have you done? How many real patients have you cared for in cardiac arrest? These are all super high level needs assessments that should be done, but it's relying on the providers, the learners often to tell you what they think they need, right? The research has moved a lot from publishing studies about how comfortable, how confident learners are as a needs assessment or as an outcome measure. We're trying to get at more you know, hard facts using SIM and unveiling these deficits in education are telling us how we can then educate better. So into our initiative. So how do you get safe and effective cardiac arrest teams? So how does it work? You have a whole bunch of providers, you train them all in ACLS or PALS if it's pediatric providers, they have varied clinical experience, and then you just throw them together the first time someone's in cardiac arrest. Do you think this leads to good care? Probably not, because you wouldn't need me to be standing here or doing the project. So we, what can we do? We can take the providers, we can acknowledge the differences in backgrounds, and we can have them train as teams. And that is excellent. We can do that in real life and debrief. We can do that with SIM. What else can we do? We can look at the human factors involved. Who just worked a 24-hour shift? Are they the best person to be doing CPR? Does someone have a shoulder injury? Are they empowered to speak up and say, I can't do CPR today? We know that CPR is the most important thing when someone's heart has stopped. So acknowledging that and just taking a second to think about it, looking at the equipment and the environment. Do people know where the equipment is? So in the ER, I'd venture to say that they do, but when you're on the rehab floor and there's a code and there hasn't been one in five years, do you think anyone remembers even where the crash cart is? tell you from experience, the answer is they don't. So all of these things can lead to safe and effective care. But how do we get to the safest and the most effective? What do you think I'm going to say? Sim. sim, thank you. So sim, and it's more than that. It's really, it's simulation and it's debriefing. So we never do a simulation without debriefing it. So when I say sim, I mean sim and debriefing. Debriefing being the facilitated conversation after that is not about any one individual's performance, but is about the teamwork and the systems and what has gone well and what could be done differently and making sure that all the gaps are closed in the system and the knowledge at that time. So this helps us to address the human factors. This helps us to identify who's really bad at CPR that maybe they need to go back and do BLS again. It lets us take the teams and throw them together and resuscitate the patient and then talk about what could have been done differently, because there's always ways that they can improve. It lets us fix the knowledge gaps. It lets us level the playing field of clinical experience. It lets the people that have not take, you know, had a cardiac arrest in real life in five years, it lets them care for one, so that if one comes in, they have experience on their side. And it lets us really in-service equipment. It lets people get familiar with the environment. It lets them know where things are. These are simple things that people don't often think about. We spend so much time training on procedures, but if you don't know how to get the equipment to do the procedure, and no, you can't always count on the nurse, although 99% of the time they will definitely save our butts, you need to know where it is, otherwise what's the point of even knowing how to do it? So for this study, we looked at in-hospital cardiac arrest, or CODE. CODE has a very, very low survival rate. We know from massive data sets in the American Heart Association that there are surrogates for survival that matter. Things like time to defibrillation, how hands-on time, how often the hands are on the chest without delays, how good our CPR is. So it's great to do CPR and do it continuously, but it needs to be the right depth. We need to be doing it correctly. We know from the team literature, like we just talked about, that knowledge and experience does not translate to effective teamwork. 
And why is it so hard? So code teams across the board are heterogeneous providers with very varied backgrounds and experience. They're coming together in an ad hoc fashion in a disaster prone environment. So the pager goes off and it's the same at Sinai and at Elmhurst and really all you know, systems. Some people may do it better, but you may get 40 residents or if it's the middle of the night, you may get three. And you could argue the merits of both of those, but you get a different complement of people every single time, many of whom have never even met. So maybe the residents know each other, but they don't know the nurse on the floor or the clinic, God forbid, where they're called. These are all things that just set the team up for failure before the cases even happened. And again, variable in hospital locations um, is another, it's just a real challenge. So you get very good in the ER, you get very good in the ICU, um, but a lot of problems when we take it outside of it. And that's what led to this initiative of doing code team simulations everywhere in the hospital. So our objectives were education and training, testing and improving the system, and then improving our education, using what we found to educate differently and to educate in a more robust way to close the loop. Our methods, logically, in situ sim. So we've done more than this, but the analyzed codes we've done to date, there were 56. These are people that are activated through our telecom paging system as if it's a real event. It's unannounced and it's impromptu. So when they come, we've had cases where it's been three or four minutes and a resident's gone, oh, it's a simulator. They come in the room with the 40 other people that respond on that day, the respiratory therapist, whoever would come as if it was a real patient, and they go to work on the simulator. You can see we've done them across the hospital, predominantly so far in the emergency department, and a lot on labor and delivery, which is somewhere, thankfully, there are very, very few codes, so this has been a real change for them in the education that they're getting. And then we systematically captured the latent safety threats and areas for improvement that we came up with. This was done again, all of the data then was coded into the four categories, and this was done by trained raters that were watching videos after the fact. And then we also scored them on an objective validated tool called the teapot and added a category looking at their adherence to the guidelines. This is our high-tech data gathering system. This is one of our debriefing post-its because we didn't even have a whiteboard, but you can see it's pretty standard. We go through it, we recap the case, we talk about what went well, and then we talk about what could have been done differently. So in this example, you can see the pads were applied. That's fantastic. They would be ready to defibrillate, but then there was a long delay because no one recognized the need to shock despite the patient being in V-fib for several minutes during the cardiac arrest. So plus delta, so throw out, has anyone been in a code in this room? Throw out some things that either go really, really well, most codes you've been at, or what are some things that could be done differently? Across the board, when you think of all the codes you've ever attended in the hospital. No one knows who's in charge. Lack of leadership, definitely on the could be done different side, absolutely. Others? Malfunctioning equipment, thank you. So these are themes we're seeing again and again. So these are just a few I threw up here. So the most glaring one up here, I'd say, is that they didn't defibrillate for six minutes, despite it being a shockable rhythm. So again, we know from the AHA guidelines that this matters. This is how you restart a heart. This is how you also preserve brain function. So back when I was a resident, the debriefing, which is in quotes on purpose, would have gone like this. The leader, someone at the bedside, would have said, hey, you didn't defibrillate within three minutes, and you should have. Any questions? And we would have all been like, no, okay, and walked away. So now the culture, 10 years, however many years later, is to debrief it and to look at this same set of issues. But now we're trying to say, what else was going on, positively or negatively, when we had that six minute delay? Why didn't we defibrillate for six minutes? Was it a systems issue? <laughs> are, are there lots of cases where there are delays to defibrillation? Hey, someone pointed out they couldn't find equipment or malfunctioning equipment. Is that why we didn't defibrillate? Did the team know how to use the defibrillator? What can we do next time so that we never have a delay to defibrillation again? Let's close the loop with the people here now, but what can we fix so that if you're not at this sim, you still won't have a delay in the future for defibrillation. So the results. So this is our team performance, and I'll go through this quickly in the interest of time. But 
you can see we looked at leadership, situation monitoring, mutual support, communication, and guideline adherence. The ED, not surprisingly, had the average highest scores because they have the most opportunity to practice. There just are the most cardiac arrests in the ED. You can see that many departments on certain domains were below 2.5. So the scoring is from one very poor to five excellent, and no one crested above a four, even getting towards excellent. So again, this is something we do and something where it really matters. So the reason that we did this is because we're trying to couple objective data with all the latent safety threats to really show what the deficits are that need to be improved upon. So when we say we don't feel like leadership is good, we can also say that on objective anchors of behavior that are translated as objectively as possible, because nothing's ever totally objective, the scoring is low, we need to fix this. Right, so we're trying to put data behind the problem through this intervention. And this is actually for situation monitoring, but this is just an example of the scoring guide that goes into the radar training so that it's not just a, ah, I felt like it was a four. It seemed like it was pretty good. You know, there are set examples of what get you a one versus a five. So we identified out of the 56 cases, 46 unique latent safety threats. The top three areas, as you pointed out, deficits in code leadership, role designation and familiarity with location, use of equipment and resources. And then we made a lot of improvements. These are some pictures from real in situs that we did, which we have permission to show. Um, this one is one of my favorites. So this is an anesthesiologist who's running the code ahead of the medicine resident's arrival. And he's asked for epi to be given. The nurse has the code tray, but there are so many people in the room that she can't figure out how to hold it to open it because there's no table. So at one point, it gets put on the patient to try to open it. So if anyone has seen the code tray, it's like a big plastic shelf that has to come off. So she can't figure out where to put it. So we actually had an over one minute delay in giving epinephrine after it was requested because they couldn't even figure out how to get the tray open to get the box out to put the Bristol jet together to give it. So again, these are simple things, but where do you put the tray? And this was on a floor where they have cardiac arrests. Part of the reason it's so crowded is like everywhere, the census was full. On the other side of this curtain, during this sim, there's a real patient with her permission. You know what she said? Absolutely, doc, please do the sim. I don't mind. Can I stay and listen when I encouraged her to leave the room? She said, because I hope if my heart stops, I would know that the team has practiced together on a dummy before you're taking care of me. So, you know, the patients get it too. It's, it's amazing to me that we're not doing this for all of our team events and giving people this safe practice opportunity. So these are just, you know, examples of simple things that we then could figure out you know, ways to do better. So at least the crash cart was in the room with the defibrillator, so they had gotten the meds. So these are some examples, and I didn't list all 46, but equipment, again, it's a lot of being unable to find things, being unable to locate the defibrillator, not sure how to activate the code team, and we saw that not once, not five times. We saw that a lot of times. And again, it depends if it's a unit that doesn't have a lot of codes, but if you can't figure out how to activate the code team, and you don't know how to run a code, you can imagine that every metric that matters is gonna be terrible and the patient outcome will suffer, you know, the patient outcome will just not be good. Medication, unsure how to locate magnesium when it wasn't in for one of the cardiac arrest rhythms. Resource systems, inconsistent responding team members, and this is the 40 if it's a Monday morning and three if it's overnight, maybe it's their first day, right? Everybody's going between Sinai and Elmhurst. So when you get someone and they're back at Elmhurst for the first day, they've forgotten all of the memory that they had of where things are and what you do and you can't always count on other people to fill in the blanks so this allows practice and then technical skill it's a lot of knowledge gaps so we are doing a great job right of education and we feel good about how we're training our residents but then you have someone at the bedside they've done ACLS they've sat in resident conference and then they can't recognize that it's VFib. Or if they recognize it's VFib, they're not shocking. You know, these are knowledge gaps, and this is not one-off. These are things that we saw time and time again. Lack of ability to do procedures, things like that. 
We're going to get into specifically some of the educational relationships, but these are some examples then of what we did to close the loop to fix what we found. So insufficient stocking, we love this example. And Alexander was, was there for this. We went to the ICU, we ran a code, you know, we had like 20 minutes, we'd be in and out, they had an empty bed. They went to do an EZIO, the bone drill, because it was an older person with terrible veins. This is the mannequin, but you all can imagine in adult medicine, this happens a lot. They went to get the EZIO, they got the drill, they came to the bedside, they opened it, there were no needles. So now what do you do? Do you get a central line kit? Do you get a nurse from somewhere else to come and help? No one could get access. And in the sim, we continued to say, you can't get access. You can't get access. No one knew how to get the needles. So then we talked about it, and now we put a new audit procedure in place. Well, we got a call about six hours later. Hey, Dr. Bentley, wanted to let you know, we just had a 90-year-old that arrested in the ICU, couldn't get access. They said it was literally almost too coincidental. And we went to get the EZIO, and there was a full stock of needles because we had just done a SIM. But it occurred to them, if we hadn't done the SIM, they would have grabbed the kit. Now this is a real patient in cardiac arrest with no access and there wouldn't have been needles. So it's identifying those things systematically and then figuring out how you will never let it happen again. So in discussion about using this for educational needs assessment, so let's talk about our top three deficits. So deficits in code leadership. This is universal. Everyone I talk to, every specialty, everywhere in the country, every hospital, when I work abroad, for some reason, we're not great at code leadership. And I think it comes back to practice. I think it comes back to having the opportunity to really just dominate the code because you get to do it enough. So we're now developing a code leader boot camp. This is a formal instruction course that'll cover the deficits that we've found in this project with deliberate practice opportunities. So all of the teaching residents, which are the third year medicine residents, and the senior peds residents, that would be the code team leader for the whole hospital at Elmhurst, basically everywhere other than the ED, um, they will be coming to us on the d first day of their rotation as the teaching resident and going through this. And it's the opportunity to do SIM and then say, hey, pause. I see you're trying to get the nurse to give epi and she does not hear you. What's a better way you could communicate this? Back up 30 seconds, go. And let them just simulate it and simulate it and simulate it until they're comfortable and you feel really good that when there's a code, they're going to walk in and take charge and actually be effective. Lack of role designation. So this was such a problem, we took it to our hospital-wide committee and we said, you know how everybody feels like the codes don't have role assignment on the floors? Yeah. Well, now we have data showing that it absolutely is happening almost every time. Is it because the policy and procedure is wrong and the codes that we've laid, the roles we've laid out are not exactly what they should be? Or is it because we're not teaching it as well as we think we are? I think it was a combination of both. So now we debrief this very explicitly every time and we've had resident conference and it's been reinforced, reinforced at nursing meetings. And lack of familiarity with the location. This has allowed us to unveil a lot of safety threats with education, so lack of training. So we got new defibrillators across the hospital and everyone got in-serviced, but clearly that wasn't enough. Getting in-serviced for two minutes to sign, you know, check a box, does not actually mean that you have touched it and turned it on and understand the way it works. So we then in-service basically the entire hospital again about it with the opportunity to have it on the simulator, have an abnormal rhythm, make sure that they knew how to actually charge it, shock, et cetera. So we closed the loop on the deficits that we found from a systems perspective, as well as improving education across the hospital. And of course, we did that through more sim. So in conclusion, and I think I'm out of time, the most significant outcome of this project was really a new system of thinking about both code team performance as well as education. One of the old CDC leaders before he retired that I met at a conference said, and it has always stuck with me, no data means no problem. Until you can actually capture data to show that you have a problem, no one will listen to you about needing to fix it, and you'll never be able to know whether or not you had an impact because you'll never be able to see that data change. So we've used In-Situ-SIM from an educational perspective as well as a systems perspective to really try to, try to quantify what we all already knew in our hearts was happening with code team performance to then take it and fix the system. 
next steps are really just continuing to do more of this. So doing it in the lobby, doing it in the MRI scanner, doing it other places that thankfully really don't have a lot of these events. I want to acknowledge my team, including Alexander Meschel, one of our amazing medical students who's here, um, and the whole team at Elmhurst. Lorraine Beam is my partner in crime who runs the center with me. But there's a lot of people that go into making this possible. So thank you, and uh, I think I have a couple minutes for questions. All right, so uh, my name is Priya Rolfus. Um, I am a third year pediatric resident, and I'm going to be talking about our investigation into implementing an asynchronous curriculum to replace the traditional in-person didactics um, in the pediatric ambulatory setting. So I have no financial disclosures. So the objectives of our study, which are also the objectives of this talk, uh, were to understand the need for novel approaches to resident education and curriculum development. We also wanted to assess learner satisfaction and buy-in to an asynchronous curriculum. And then lastly, we'll formulate next steps in addressing the gaps of an asynchronous curriculum. So for some background, as we all know, there's increasing use of asynchronous curricula in medical education. Some of my co-residents have asked me what exactly does asynchronous mean. Um, so for those who don't know the term, um, it just basically means curricula that are done separately outside of the general classroom environment on their own time. So at different times, people can do things at their own pace. As we know, there's increasing clinical demands, and that's made it... Um, clinical demands as well as different uh, residents at different sites has made it more challenging to find protected time for, to bring all the residents together. And that's led residency programs to implement more and more online asynchronous curricula. We know that online curricula are already well um, widely used in undergraduate medical education. And there's been studies that show that the integration of online curricula into undergraduate medical education has been well received by students. And it also has been shown to improve knowledge, clinical skills, and other learning outcomes. So our program uh, will basically was looking at uh, implementing the Johns Hopkins Pediatric Education and Assessment Center, also known as PEAK. It's an online ambulatory curriculum that was developed to allow residents access at their convenience over the year. So they are able to access all the educational materials on their own time outside of the general workday. It consists of 55 evidence-based and case-based modules that are um, have links to pertinent articles and recent guidelines, and it's already been employed at over 50 pediatric training programs across the country. Just to give some further background about what the ACGME requires for pediatric education, as we might expect, the program must have planned educational experiences, and it has to include individual study as well as group learning exercises. And then, of course, it must establish requirements for resident and faculty participation and the resident participation must be monitored so as you might expect an asynchronous curriculum is nice for programs because it allows that independent study in a more formalized setting and it also is very easy to mon monitor resident participation so the gaps in the literature would basically prior studies have shown that there is positive learner satisfaction and immediate knowledge acquisition among residents who use the Johns Hopkins curricula in internal medicine. What this means is basically they looked at um, the modules which have a pre and a post test after them. They looked and found that post test scores were higher than pre test scores. So immediately after you finish the module, you learn something from it and you do better on the post test. There's no published studies that have assessed the feasibility and long-term efficacy of an asynchronous curriculum, especially in pediatrics, and there are no studies that comment on long-term knowledge outcomes of asynchronous curricula, particularly in graduate medical education. As I previously mentioned, in undergraduate medical education, this has been studied. So just to give you a background on how our program was doing um, basically was delivering educational materials for pediatric ambulatory care. We had 30 minute lecture series prior to clinic. So residents would go to their uh, continuity clinic from 1.30 to 5. And before the 1.30 uh, patient arrived, there was a 30 minute lecture from 1 to 1.30. And so residents were coming from other clinical sites. They were coming from the floors. They were coming from the ICUs. And as a result, we sort of noticed that there were some challenges with this model. Residents weren't able to come on time. They were distracted by their other clinical demands. The room in which we gave these lectures was not super conducive to um, being able to focus because it was a room with all of our computers, um, with our preceptors, and we'd have nurses and techs coming in and out. And so it was 
not the most conducive to learning. And so this sort of prompted us to decide that we want to implement this online curriculum, um, and we chose the Johns Hopkins curriculum. There are actually maybe two or three that exist, but this is the most popular that's being used currently. So the aims of our study were to compare the newly implemented asynchronous curriculum with the prior in-person didactic curriculum. We specifically wanted to look at learner satisfaction, learner buy-in and access to the curriculum, and then ultimately knowledge acquisition. And our overarching goal was to identify an improved model for resident education on fundamental ambulatory topics in pediatrics. So all of this is in just um, to give some you know, better understanding is all in addition to our academic half days, which are cover inpatient topics and subspecialty topics. So this is just looking at pediatric ambulatory curriculum. So basically we surveyed 37 pediatric residents who were exposed to at least one year of the in-person didactic curriculum. We then, the survey questions assessed attendance at and satisfaction with the in-person curriculum, expectations of the peak curriculum, so it hadn't yet been implemented, and personal preference for curriculum type. So do you prefer an online curriculum or would you prefer being inside a classroom? The peak curriculum was then made available to all of our residents. We explained how to sign up and we gave them a schedule for how to complete the modules in the academic year. And then we collected the data on module completion of the asynchronous curriculum for the first six months after we implemented it. So we had about an 87% uh, response to our survey. Um, and this first graph shows uh, what residents felt, how they felt about the in-person conference attendance. So our program's expectation is that 100% of um, the lectures should be attended by residents. But in reality, when they were surveyed, residents felt that they were only able to attend about 50%. And that was because um, maybe they were coming from somewhere else and they weren't able to attend on time, or maybe it was because they were on night float and they weren't scheduled to be in clinic that day, or maybe they were on a rotation where they didn't come to clinic at all, like in the PICU, for example. So they felt they were only getting 50% of the lectures. And then of that, half of them, they were able to attend on time. Then we asked them how focused did they feel they were during the conferences. And you can see 0% felt they were very focused. Uh, and really the majority of the people felt very distracted in that setting. When we asked residents if they preferred an in-person curriculum to an asynchronous curriculum, about two-thirds of them felt they would prefer an asynchronous curriculum. Again, this is before, that they, before they had even experienced it. This was just their expectation. So six months later, after the peak curriculum was implemented, we collected data to see how many modules the residents completed. And again, our program expects that we would have completed 100% of the modules, or in half a year, 50% of the modules. The residents, when they were surveyed, expected that they would finish about 70% over a year, which was 35% over six months. And then in reality, as you can see, um, they were only able to complete 6% of the modules. So really, this was not reaching our residents in the way that we had hoped. So some more just interesting data. Uh, we found that there was no linear relationship between the learners projected and actual modules completed. So on the x-axis, you can see the modules that an individual resident expected to complete. And on the y-axis are the modules they actually completed. Um, and there was no correlation. If someone thought they were going to finish all the modules, that did not mean that they were going to. <laughs> And then here again, we looked at there was no, found that there was no association between learner learning tool preference and the number of modules completed. So if a resident felt that they preferred an online module system, that did not mean that they completed more modules than someone who preferred an in-person didactics. So in conclusion, um, we confirmed our suspicion that the in-person didactics were inaccessible, likely due to the timing of them and the venue. We found that the asynchronous curriculum, while it was well received by students and residents had high expectations for their completion, in reality the completion rates were far, far below the projected rates. And at that point we decided we needed to sort of assess the barriers to resident participation in this curriculum and we wanted to address them to see if we could improve the accessibility. Um, just making the curriculum available without any follow-up was not sufficient to engage the learners. And therefore, we sort of concluded that it's likely that we can't necessarily apply education mo educational models that are successful in undergraduate medical education to those um, in graduate medical education. 
So looking forward, we basically, so this is just a great timeline, just to understand where we were and where we're going. So before um, the peak modules were implemented, we had the in-person didactics, which we've now demonstrated are inaccessible to our residents. Then last year, we had the asynchronous curriculum only with not, you know, no supplementation of that material. And we show that that was also not accessible. Um, when we surveyed residents afterwards, we found that people felt the, the most a uh, popular reason for why they weren't able to complete the modules beca was because they didn't have enough protected time. They also felt they had a lack of accountability or repercussions for not completing the modules, and they believed that, some of them believed that it wasn't contributing to their learning at all. So this year, what we've done is we've implemented the blended learning model. We've created a more multifaceted curriculum, so we've included team-based incentives to complete modules. We've also started a monthly noon conference series, uh, which delivered by the residents. So each group of two to three residents is assigned a topic that correlates with one of the modules and they deliver that uh, information to the co their co-residents. And then we also incorporated a monthly board review which goes over topics that were assigned that month and in board review style there is delivered by the faculty and the teams of residents work together to complete the questions. So it encourages the competitive spirit. So then next year, um, for the next academic year, we're going to survey all the residents again, see if this is working better. We hypothesize and we are already aware that there are more modules that have been completed this year than last year in the same time period. Um, and so we hope to tweak our curriculum further. So, does anybody have any questions?